Right. So it's really interesting for me to be following uh, our previous speaker because a lot of what has been said statistically, I'm going to kind of reflect through a kind of personal reflection of my career and where I am and how that relates to class, or at least that's what I'm going to try to do. So what you're going to have is, uh, from my presentation, is a sort of personal journey. Um, and we're going to do a bit of travelling in time back and forth because I get bored with just doing the chronology. So we're going to go back and forth a bit. Okay. So I'm going to start here. So um, some of my colleagues have been saying to me recently that they're a bit sick of being referred to as children of Windrush. But um, for me, that's not the case at all. Um, and I'm currently in the work that I'm making, kind of contemplating what Windrush means to me personally. Um, and kind of, I'm doing that a lot by looking at particular images from my family um, album. Um, and in the work that I've been doing since the 1980s up until today, particular images from that family album reoccur. And this is one of my favourites. And it's been a pop-up book and it's been all kinds of things. Um, so anybody that's from the Midlands will know that Western Supermare and Rill are the two destinations that you go to for a day trip because we're a bit landlocked in the Midlands. Um, and I'm hoping that by showing you this 1973 image, you'll understand that the two coloured girls in the cardigans um, are the children of um, migrants that arrived in the UK in the 1950s. And on this particular trip to, day trip to Western, uh, the photographer is my mother. And she would have been in the UK from 1956. Um, so she's taking the photograph of her two little girls. But what's, what I, when I look at this image, what I also see in that image, and what I reflect on is who's welcome and who's not welcome. And I reflect on how it felt to be on a day trip to Western Supermare in 1973. Um, yeah. I'm, I absolutely love this image. I love the... Um, sorry, I'm walking away from the microphone. Can I do this? Uh, I threatened to do it earlier. Paul. You can tell I'm not used to using a microphone. Uh, I love these firemen. Um, I love that this little boy in the blue is looking not at me and my sister, and if you haven't recognised me, I'm, I'm the one in the pink cardigan, um, but I think he's looking at my mother. And I love that the gentleman in the far left is also looking. But as you can see, even though we're on the beach and we're there's probably been some donkey rides happening. There's not a lot of smiling going on. So there's a kind of tension in Western in 1973. And so when I'm looking at these images now, um, I'm reflecting on a number of things. So my statistics are not really anywhere near as elegant as the ones you saw earlier. Um, I'm thinking that in 1970, between 1973 and 1958, that's 15 years. And then my mother, who is now 83, um, is suffering from Alzheimer's. She lives in a retirement village. We'll come on to that in a minute. And I'm thinking that in 15 years, she would have been nursing as she did. Um, she worked with, um, in the National Health Service with people who were suffering from, um, what did they call it then? They called it geriatrics, that's what she did. She worked with geriatrics and most of her patients 
weren't Windrushers. Uh, she worked nights. And she'd also have been sending her four children to school. And she would have gone to 10 years worth of parents' evenings. In those days, we did have parents' evenings about once a term. Um, and there were four children, so I don't know how many that is, but it's quite a lot. Um, and by 1973, her eldest child would have been just about the age where you have to start worrying about a stop and search if, you have a, if you've got a brown boy and you're living in the inner city. So those are the kinds of things that kind of come to mind when I look at that, that family album. Um, so now I'm just going to bring you really far forward to um, what I'm currently doing, ish. So about four years ago, I got involved in a project called um, Black Artists and Modernism, and there was a film that came out at the, in the middle of last year, which looked at the history of black artists in the UK, kind of. It was a bit, you know, it's a lot of history for like 60 minutes on the BBC, but you know, it kind of gave a roundup of the kinds of activities that black artists have been doing. And it started, um, it, it focused on artists in the post-war kind of period, but there was a concentration of artists that would have been actually my parents' generation, that would have come over not as migrants to work in the NHS, but as kind of middle-class Caribbeans who came to um, be educated here. And then there's my generation, which were really, you know, a kind of phenomenon of um, black, British, born or educated people who went to art college in a kind of massive way that hadn't happened before. And the impact of that, I think, was the black arts movement, which is referred to in this, in this um, documentary. Um, so, I guess what I'm saying to you is that in between, see I've got myself into trouble now, in between 1973 and um, 2017, I'd taken steps to become an artist. Uh, I'm just going to whiz through some of these because this is just kind of evidence of what I'm doing now. Um, in 1982, um, I joined um, an, a group of other black art students um, who came together to show our work, to kind of discuss our existence, our relationship to the UK, to being black and British, to a history of empire and colonialism and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, I just want to, I just wanted, today I wanted to talk a little bit about, again, about that thing about being welcome and being unwelcome. Um, the slide that we saw just earlier about the meritocracy and about how people become artists because, they, because their work is good or not good um, really resonates with me because in my career as a student um, activist and uh, organizer of exhibitions and things and other types of activism, um, up until today when I'm often working with young artists and art students of color, I'm constantly hearing the same types of stories about um, you know, about a, a kind of precarious existence, about um, being invisible and unwelcome, um, or about being over-visible and um, racialized. Now, some of you might be thinking that that's got nothing to do with class. And I do find myself struggling 
to speak specifically about class and to detach that from other, other parts of my identity because I've never experienced class in absence of race and gender. Um, but I do look at this image of um, members of the Black Art Group and Sonia Boyce. And I think about what our socioeconomic backgrounds were. And if I run through those artists, Claudette Johnson, Donald Rodney, Keith Piper, myself at the top in the brown jacket and Sonia Boyce at the front, all of us came from migrant parents and those migrant parents didn't come here to go to university, they came here to work in the NHS, um, in the lower echelons of the NHS, in the laundry and you know, as the auxiliary nurses and um, to be cleaners and cooks. Uh, and it does strike me that um, when I look at the, the work of those artists, um, it seems to me that those artists were particularly vocal um, in looking at, um, in, in addressing those issues in their work. Uh, one of the, the other things that I found when I was kind of looking back at, um, yeah, not only do I mess about with my own archive, my personal archive, my personal um, family album. I'm also spending a lot of time with other types of archival material, particularly archival material related to the 1980s and to the black arts movement of the 1980s. And I, and I, I came across this um, visitor's book. And I'm going to go back again. Um, in 1982, when I was a 16, 17-year-old um, uh, teenager who was kind of a bit bored and spent too much time in bed on a Saturday morning. Um, this poster arrived and I went along to the exhibition that it refers to at the Icon Gallery in Birmingham. And so this visitor's book is actually from that same exhibition. And it wasn't until quite recently when I was looking through some of this material that I noticed the signature of um, Monica Ross. I don't know if you can see that sort of three lines down, M. Ross, and she says, succinct, powerful, moving. And some of you will know that Monica Ross was also a working class artist, um, that she was um, her reputation is really built on the work that she did around feminist art in the 1970s. And that in the 1980s, she happened to come along to the Icon Gallery to see this exhibition and was really supportive of that work. And it, I, I was reflecting the other day about the, the kinds of supports and networks that artists like Monica Ross um, created for artists like myself. Um, and, and one of the reasons that I was reflecting on that is because when the black art group and artists of my generation were making noises about race in particular, it wasn't particularly well received in the 1980s. It was seen as unnecessary, nothing to do with the art, ungrateful. Um, So in 1984, um, my mother does actually feature quite a lot in my work. In 1985, I should say not 84, um, I was invited by Lubaina Himid to take part in an exhibition at the ICA in London called The Thin Black Line. And at that time, um, about six months before this exhibition, which opened in October 1985, I'd been on a march in London, and the march was protesting the um, was pro was a protest against what had happened to a migrant 
um, a Commonwealth migrant from the Caribbean called Cherry Gross. And what had happened is that um, the police had been looking for her son, had come to her house in the morning, about 7 a.m., searching for this young man. And um, they'd shot her. And she was, um, she was paralyzed. Um, and so the image, it's actually not a bad likeness of my mom, although she, she hated it. Um, and behind her is yet another image from, from the same family album. Um, and that image is of my little sister's birthday party. So when I look at these images from my, my family album, sometimes what I see, as well as who's welcome and who isn't welcome, I see the attempts at respectability. Um, um, and the way that the that my migrant parents attempted to uh, adopt and adapt um, the, you know, this kind of social norms of the host nation. That's what I see. My mother probably wouldn't see that at all. She'd just see a lovely party. Um, okay, I'm just gonna take you here. So in 1987, I made this piece of work, which is, uh, in some ways, you see, it brings together, for me, in terms of its content, a lot of the, the kind of uh, knotty issues that we find so difficult to discuss around the socio-economic and how that impacts on what art is made. Um, and um, I've got two more minutes, so I'm just gonna tell you very briefly that the vase, which is standing on that shelf, was made by my, was crocheted by my mom. The hot citrus plastic flowers that are in it um, are the kinds of flowers that I would have found in my mother's living room and in other living rooms of that kind of ilk at that kind of time that I would have hated, actually, in 1973 because they were so Caribbean. And the images on the right-hand side, um, the top right is uh, an astonishing African-American sculptor She's astonishing because she was born during slavery uh, and went on to have a fabulously successful career as a sculptor. The second image is a self-portrait by an artist called uh, Simone Alexander. The third are the hands of Magdalene Adondo, who is a ceramicist, a potter, and the image is taken by Ingrid Pollard, who is a photographer, and the last is an image by another photographer called Brenda Agard. And I don't know if I need to say to you why it's significant that the, the, the thing is called art history, but it's really asking those questions about what art is, um, where artists come from, and it's this kind of response to two essays. One is um, um, it's kind of speaking back to um, a room of one's own. Uh, and also speaking to an essay that I was reading at the time, I believe, um, by Alice Walker, which the title of which is In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. Uh, I'm going to leave it there because I have run out of time. Um, but I guess if I was going to kind of summarise, I would say that my entire career, I've been really conscious of thresholds. Um, and had, and I'm still conscious of those those thresholds and the extent to which um, I'm not meant to be there. Um, the extent to which um, spaces have physical thresholds um, which are not welcoming and which are difficult for certain people to cross, 
And I've, I've worked in contexts where, um, where I'm working with people who can see the threshold and they're trying to dissolve it. Um, and, and that's work that I'm still engaged in. Okay, I'm going to leave that. Leave it there. Thank you.